Um, on behalf of everyone, thanks so much for being part of the Millie sessions. This is uh, day six, uh, and we're really excited to have this session. It's something that we've been talking about actually since the beginning of this idea of working on International Archives Week. Um, the, just to give you a broad sense, uh, this is a, a volunteer group of individuals and communities interested in the nurturing of archives um, across South Asia, really. And if you're interested in being part of this conversation and collaboration, please just head on to milli.link to see ways in which we can collaborate and discuss how to make archives accessible and also discuss the politics of the archive. With that said, I will hand it over to Aparna, who is going to lead this uh, particular session on Archives Beyond Borders. Over to you, Aparna. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this session on Archives Beyond Borders. So before I introduce our panelists today, a little bit about how this panel came about. Now, um, five, six years back, I did extensive field work in uh, Lahore. I went there thrice. I was working on the Lahore conspiracy case trial. I can already see one of my panelists smiling. Um, uh, and in during that time, uh, I, I met a lot of people. I, there were lots of bureaucratic hurdles that I faced. And a question that kept, kept coming back to me again and again was, why are these archives inaccessible to us? What can we do differently to, uh, for all of us across the borders to be able to access these archives? And, uh, do, and since then, some of us have been collaborating or trying to organize workshops uh, to bring the archivists on other sides together. And uh, some have happened, some have not happened. But the pandemic, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, gave us a chance to bring this together, make this happen as part of the International Archives Week. So here we are um, on uh, a panel of its, the only panel in our uh, session this week on uh, which has invited archivists from South Asia other than India. Uh, from a country other than India. So uh, now quickly on to my, um, my panelists today. So uh, we have uh, Professor Nadeem Omar Tarar with us. He's an anthropologist and an art historian by training. And he has published extensively on the history of colonial anthropology, folklore, and art education in Punjab. He serves currently as the executive director of the Center for Culture, Culture and Development in Islamabad. And previously, he has served as the director of National College of Arts, Ravel Pindi. And he is the one who founded the National College of Arts Archives, the repository of administrative records of the NCA since its inception as Mayo School of Arts in 1875. And you know who the principal of the archives was, uh, of the college was at that time. It was Lockwood Kipling, Rodrigo Kipling's father. Uh, the, our second panelist is Professor Kamal Khalid. She is an art historian specializing in 19th century Sikh paintings. Currently, she's working as the director of Punjab Archives in Lahore. And previously, Kamalji has served as the keeper of painting collection at Lahore Museum and also taught at Lahore College for Women at, and at the University of Punjab. And she also has the honor of having designed some stamps for the government of Pakistan that were issued in 2015 and 2018. And you know where the Punjab archives is? It's in Anarkali's tomb. So she will be telling us more about it. Our third panelist is Ali Usman Kasmi. Uh, he's a historian at Lahore University of Management Studies. Before joining LUMS, he was a Newton Fellow for postdoctoral research at the Royal Holloway, Holloway, Holloway College and University of London. He has also published extensively with several articles, monographs, edited volumes on Ehle Quran movements in the Punjab, the Ahmadis, the Shia community, and on Iqbal. And once I asked uh, Ali how he worked on Ahmadis and how uh, and how come he didn't get into trouble with his family and friends uh, since he worked on the Ahmadiyya community, and he was like, they don't read. So I was like, okay, that makes it easy. So um, we would like to uh, begin this session by having each of the speakers tell us about their experiences with different archives. <laughs> and if they're associated with a certain archives and the nature of collection in each of these archives. And uh, you will have about 10 minutes each or 10, 10 15 minutes each to uh, talk about your experiences. Now, before we uh, start with the, um, you know, each of them, each of the speakers talking about their experiences, uh, 
Maya Dodd, who's our tech support today, has some instructions for all the audience. So I'll, I'll let Maya uh, give her instructions to everyone. Thank you so much, Aparna. We're so excited to have this session happen. And that's why we're even more particular today about our housekeeping tips. Uh, I request all participants to basically keep themselves on mute, have their videos switched off. Uh, of course, panelists will be speaking when you know they are. And after they finish, I request the panelists to also mute themselves. Uh, in the meantime, uh, the conversation is free flowing. The chat box is open. Uh, it's the space in which you would post your questions. We really hope that the tone is respectful and the chatter is minimal. It's to the point. Uh, the idea is to generate questions for the end of the session. Uh, the way we do that is that you have the option to raise your hand. The button is at the bottom of your screen. And when you finish your question, kindly lower your hand. So we'll collect the questions and direct them to Aparna at the end. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Maya. And we're just taking some of the precautions because we got Zoom bombed a few days back. And you never know with the cross-border stuff happening, what can happen. So let's hope it all goes well. So we'll start with Kamalji. Kamalji, would you like to introduce yourselves and talk? You have 10 minutes. All right. I think, first of all, I must thank Aparna for getting us all together. And uh, it came from nowhere, frankly speaking. And when it came in, I was really kind of, you know, surprised. And I must say, pleasantly surprised at how things uh, can get along uh, under all these very difficult circumstances from every perspective. And um, okay, I am uh, Kamal Khaled and uh, um, now I am primarily an art historian because I started as a graphic designer and then things turned out to be different for me. But anyway, so within that capacity, uh, my area of specialization has been South Asian history of art, architecture, and design. And um, to tell you very honestly, um, I must share a small experience here that I did my master's, I did my bachelor's, I did everything. But for, during all my uh, academic years, I had never ever been uh, taught about South Asian arts. So it came as a complete surprise to me when this subject was introduced in my MPhil uh, courses as South Asian history of art. Um, I would never mind accepting this fact that this was the first time that I was ever properly introduced to the art of indigenous uh, land, the land that we live. I mean, like, but because Previously, we were all talking about the Europe and how grand they were and the Renaissance and Baroque and all that. But anyway, it was a good experience and it inspired me so much that I did my, uh, I chose a local topic, especially uh, the topic which was never given much of a scholarly approach. And that was the Sikh painting. I'm talking about 2002 and three. Now there is a lot has been written about the Sikh heart and all that. So I focused my research on the 19th century art that was produced primarily un uh, under the Sikh rulers, Maharaja Ranjit Singh and later on by Maharaja Shir Singh. So that was my area of specialization. And from then on, I took it as, a, you can say, as a mission to teach everywhere about South Asia and what we are, the philosophies and the concepts. So within that capacity, immediately after, uh, after doing my PhD, I was asked to join as a keeper painting at the Hall Museum. That was really an honor for me. And I served there uh, for a few years. It was a huge learning experience. And much of my research was also based on the paintings of the Hall Museum. And from uh, there, since I'm a government officer, so I moved on to other institu institutions. I taught at NCA and then at the Hall College and then at Punjab University. And then ultimately, a uh, few months back, I was being posted as director of Punjab Archives. Now that is uh, a very interesting um, portfolio and something which is very much after my heart. And I have been working here, or rather, I've been associated with Punjab Archives for more than, uh, I don't know, 2003, four, because when I started my research, I started from Punjab Archives. And this is what I believe in, that every researcher who is working on any kind of arts or history or politics, the beginning point must be uh, the art, no matter where you are, which part of the city, uh, which part of the world you are living. But this is where I started from. 
and then my love affair with Punjab archives began way, way back. And um, almost two years back, I was again contacted by uh, the high officials of Punjab archives and they wanted me to work on a publication associated to Punjab archives. So within their, that capacity, after many hurdles that we all face all the time, uh, the first ever publication associated to the Punjab archives since its uh, uh, date of inception um, came as uh, Punjab archives uh, from colonial to uh, from Mughal to colonial era. So it was basically, um, uh, and I co-authored it with uh, Mr. Abbas Chupaisa, who has been the ex-director of Punjab Archives. He contributed one chapter and I contributed the uh, other chapter. Um, his chapter was, uh, rather my chapter was about uh, the history of the building first, because that has always inspired me. And the character of Anarkali has been so intriguing to me. So this was the time when I, uh, literally, uh, you know, kind of concentrated all my energies to find that either it was a myth or reality. And then uh, that was the first part of my chapter. And from then on, I moved to uh, how the tomb was treated during the Sikh era and then the British era. So that was uh, the gist of my research. And the third part was about uh, the Punjab archives how it developed and what happened and what was the history and how many who, who, people who were involved with the, uh, with the development of this archives and all that. And uh, from there, um, the other chapter was focused on the establishment of different institu administrative institutions of Punjab that was written by Abbas Chupaisa. And he talked about the education department and the health department and all that and being established. So um, saying this, um, this is uh, the brief bio about me and my latest venture that I'm sharing with you. And uh, the research I did um, the other day in our uh, dry session, we were talking about uh, Nadeem Saab, a very really interesting point about uh, uh, this place being called the record office of the archives. So I had my research already done in the book and uh, that was in 1789. It was the French national. Uh, there was an ordinance that was approved the same year when the French Revolution came that introduced um, uh, archives as an independent uh, department. And uh, this was picked up by other countries as well. But it was the British who took it up and they uh, they declared this, uh, uh, this, this uh, instead of using the word archive, I'll be sharing some of my notes also. Uh, in, um, so we have this, uh, 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 the English pub uh, were the one who uh, said that in uh, 1838, instead of using the word archives, they used the word, uh, the English public record. So in much of the Commonwealth countries and uh, the British associated uh, colonies and all that, they use the word record or uh, record office. So um, in India as well, they use the word the record office. So the archives was never meant, was never used for uh, the all the archive collection that we have. But after 1947, the word archives was associated with it because for the British, um, it was just uh, a repository of all the meeting minutes or things like that. For them, it was a record. But after 1947, whatever was record for them, a contemporary at times has become an archive for us. So from 1947 onwards, over the years, uh, this is how uh, the Institute of Punjab Archives has developed. To do. So. Ji, in two minutes, can you tell us about the collections at the Punjab archives? I believe yes. they're very rich. And very of course, and uh, I'll definitely again, I'll be uh, consulting my notes because this is something <laughs> I cannot memorize it all time. Um, uh, I will be very brief about it. I am 
and I'll go chronologically. It will make things uh, easier for everyone. We do have uh, some Persian record. Uh, actually, the record is primarily divided in two categories. One is the Persian record uh, from the language perspective, and the other is other one is, of course, in English. And uh, we have a record from Mughal period onward, that is 1629, that is Shah Jahan's period. So we have some documents associated to Shah Jahan period, and then it comes up to 1858. So these are the Persian records associated to uh, the Mughal dynasty and uh, different uh, rulers that have been associated to it. Then we have the Persian record associated to Sikh period that is from 1799 to 1849. So this is much of whatever the activity was going on during Maharaja Ranjit Singh's period and his descendants. Oh, and a very important factor of this uh, uh, collection is, um, uh, is the documents associated to the government. And um, because much of the records, as I have already told you, these are basically, you could call them minutes of the meeting how the uh, the discussions were made, how the ideas were introduced, and then there were lots of brainstorming. And then after the brainstorming, we come up to the, uh, the decisions. So uh, the whole, uh, by going through these documents, you can understand that how different institutions were developed and how different institutions were made that literally changed the fate of uh, the subcontinent and so on. And then uh, we have a um, Persian record, record that is associated to the British uh, who have been, uh, you know, uh, came here in, as in residences and all that. And that became from, uh, began from 1809 to 1890. This is the record which is in the Persian language, but it has been associated with the British uh, uh, officers and all those who have been uh, associated to the residencies. And then we have a very interesting colonial agencies record. Now these were the different agencies of uh, colonial period and uh, much of them are associated with the subcontinent and all that. That is like Delhi, um, Patiala, Kapoothala and uh, the Allahabad. So these are the record of uh, residences associated to different uh, agencies. And then we have the record of princely states in Punjab from 1849 to 1947. And um, of course, after the annexation, that is 1849 to 1947, that is purely British record in, uh, in the English language. That is also here. Um, much of the record is uh, pre-partition, belong to the uh, pre-partition era. And uh, we do not have, um, and it is very comprehensive and it is, um, it's there. And then we have the record after 1947 that goes up to 2002 and 2003. But um, that, is, uh, that is not as detailed as it used to be pre-partition. So this was the basic, very brief gist of what Punjab archives hold till today. Thank you, Kamalji. That was a great uh, overview of uh, the Punjab State Archives. Uh, I will come back to this, but then uh, I'll be asking you later about website and digitization, because I believe some of the stuff is out there in Karachi that has been digitized. So our audience would like to know that and how we can access it from this side. So cool. next, uh, if Nadeem Saab, are you there? Or he's gone off for a smoke? <laughs> Nadeem Saab, are you there? I think he went for a smoke. So oh, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> okay. So Nadeem Saab, uh, you have 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. So please tell us yeah. about your archiving experiences, how you put together the NCA archive and anything else you want to talk about. Hmm. Uh, I, you know, uh, first my connection is bad. So I might sort of go off air and you may make your presumptions. Uh, from that, let me, you know, quickly uh, get to uh, your question about the access to the archives. I think access to Pakistani archive is not uh, uh, sort of uh, restricted by borders. I mean, I as an individual will have as much difficulty in getting 
uh, to the archives as you as a uh, as a foreigner. So I mean, there is something that I don't know uh, about the structure of governance in Pakistan, which makes access to archive difficult. You know, it is true for let's say you know Punjab archives. I mean, as far as I had my student days accessing, you know, facing trouble in accessing archives. Uh, uh, I think it is the uh, same is the case uh, with other archives, the National Archives of Pakistan, one. Uh, number two, I mean, archives are very, uh, I would say, uh, low in the order of government priority. I mean, for some odd reason, Pakistani state has not give, at, attached any value, even for money, in terms of the record, uh, which are kept, you know, something like a 16th century uh, paper or a manuscript or whatever it is, it, it, it has some monetary value, even just on the face of it. So what we're saying is, okay, this is again a second puzzle that I have for me, which is uh, prompted by you uh, in terms of, uh, you know, access that there is something in the structure of governance which makes it inaccessible as well as at the same time gives it the administrative position in national archives has not been filled. There's no digital access in archives. So uh, this is as far as my journal experience uh, with the park. archives is concerned. Now coming about being founded the archive, I think it again uh, brings me back to the first question that uh, NCA is a very sort of illustrious institution now. I mean, it has a legacy which is kind of comparable to Royal College of Art or JJ School of Art or and so on and so forth. And it is because of also because of Kipling's sort of, uh, uh, you know, fame attached to it, Rudyard and Lockwood. So it kind of stands out among the rest of the art schools in India in some way. At the same time, this is an art school for which, uh, you know, very little is known. And even as we speak, I routinely read in various publications, inaccurate dates attributed to the foundation of the school. And almost, I would say nothing, almost I'm saying, apart from few biographical accounts like Satesh such as, Gujral of BC Sanyals, not very much is known about the new school of thought beyond the Kipling period. You know what happened in 20th century? There's a, there's a lot, must have, lot has happened. And if you look at all the art histories from Patha Mitter to Tapati Koha to, I don't know, who, uh, there are loads of others. Uh, uh, you know, barring Arandam Dutta, who has actually focused on uh, Mew School and so on. A very little South Asian scholarship has actually focused on the Mio school and uh, kind of treated it as like uh, one among uh, the others and not thinking that Punjab could have been a different case. I mean, as a historian, every sort of a part of the colony had uh, to negotiate with the, uh, with the metropolitan and the colonial governments in their own way. So Punjab was a special case. So, but despite its political, cultural history uh, being written around, these art school experience of the Mio school was completely forgotten. Now, another point that it was also forgotten by the very people who, for whom this legacy of the Mio school starting with Kipling means something to celebrate, right? And unfortunately, by the time I joined NC as an anthropologist, I was teaching in cultural studies department and had no previous experience of the archive beyond the interest that anthropologists even don't have interest. But I had a in, budding interest in history, so I was curious about the archive. So by that time, around, let's say, 1999, then 2001, when one 25th anniversary of NC being celebrated, there was not even a monograph on the Muse school. Right? Not, there were, you know, so there were bits and pieces of information. Nadir Shatala wrote a piece, Bhai Ram Singh got into it. And when we started the archive and then data came in, so Saj Dabandal wrote a very brilliant uh, monograph on uh, Ram Singh. 
who was a completely forgotten character i can assure you still you know when i you know go through this there's so many nameless uh, individuals you know who achieved excellence in 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 their own fields whose names are forgotten uh, so it became the history of the new school became a kind of a historical dustbin to it was consigned and then there were many reason that i when i kind of asked this question to why this administrative record was scrapped all i know uh, come to know that sponnenberg there was a guy called mark sponnenberg he was the first principal of nca new school uh, ran from 1875 to 1958 and from 1958 it was turned into national college of arts and uh, then it was so he 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 uh, kind of uh, he was clearing up lots of uh, you know uh, spaces in, in, in the in the college premises that he found these uh, sacks uh, or the or, or the old records put in the sacks and then he kind of had them placed in a relatively safer room from where i retrieved he did it around 1960 and i retrieved it from there uh, in uh, 97 98 so imagine uh, for all these years the paper had a had a you know had a very varied existence from clearly kept record to uh, something which is uh, almost to be as good as you know destroyed so to say so we put them back into rooms sort them out and try to figure it out what they were honestly it took me like 5 years of <laughs> smoking to actually figure out what these papers means because there was too there was like scattered and there no system then we discovered a register where it says uh, the it gives out the list of the files and then we thought that these files had a certain subjects there were some accounts file and say ac account and then exhibition file then you know we we kind of almost did the detective work and managed to then finally a system to which all the administrative record from uh, in fact from 1890 onwards to date if you like you know at least uh, uh, you know till the 70s uh, it was chronologically organized into different subjects so if you want to look up exhibition files imagine uh, there are hundreds of files on exhibition and such a uh, rich detail that i just fail to you know think that how all of this could just be trashed and uh, let me finally tell you that despite the fact that uh, you know this uh, the, the, this is a, like a common knowledge that there is an archive exists in pakistan right uh, there are some overseas students uh, you know coming in and sort of taking bits and pieces of what they like like shaila bhatti who was a, who did her phd on the hor museum relied on the records and so on but there has never been any systematic focus uh, on the subject still as we speak it's such a subject that nobody really uh, kind of uh, considered worth their while so archives are suffering from a kind of a historical disconnect as well as some kind of professional uh, disconnect as well that are art historian the loads of institution within pakistan in lahore and karachi and islamabad and i was been the teach giving out art history degrees architecture degrees and i mean because i am writing something around it so i can actually share a lot that is actually will be kind of news to the art is uh, to the world of art history uh, because new school of art has such a, a kind of a you know rich experience it was you know delhi uh, presently khyber pakhtunkhwa frontier province baluchistan and some of sen all of that was actually covered by punjab under new school it punjab and its dependencies so that what it was catering to it was like half the india so to say you know great part of the north and north india was under the influence of the school and are from the archaeological survey of india to the every imperial darbar to every tiny mini exhibition in delhi to calcutta to wherever in india in madras and so on uh, they there was a paper trail connecting new school with all of this 
these imperial shows has tons of files on these imperial shows who were the artists what were the prices of the paintings and how they were and so what i'm saying is ki you know despite the fact that it's a very small archive compared to what dr kamal has said it's a huge sort of political economic uh, you know sort of documentation here it is this is small school history which is kind of insignificant uh, for those who are not artists for that matter so it has no profile unlike hsm college uh, which was a chief college comparable to new college ajmer Uh, so it, it it had a kind of a huge social status and a profile, but this institution, uh, uh, the all the richness and the quality of the information that is there, is actually very limited in terms of its uh, scope and impact. It did not produce great leaders, uh, politicians, or bureaucrats. What it produced was designers, you know, artists, painters. you know who were imagining uh, you know sort of in you know their world in their own creative ways and it is such a uh, i would say uh, you know kind of a shame that most of these artists of the mio school have been uh, kind of ignored primarily because this image of the school as a craft school this binary distinction between the art and the craft you know colonialist craft you know this national discourse Uh, on art has actually played against itself that as a result as 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 a result of that this has produced almost a historical amnesia where uh, we just forget uh, that, that 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 there were different trajectories of uh, knowledge uh, and different kind of forms of uh, colonialism and its uh, you know knowledge formations that we need to understand in order to understand our post colonial subjectivity you know this separation between the colonial and the post colonial with the x is a has a disastrous effect on indian history there are uh, hist- histories of the colonial period and there are histories of the modern india as if they they were they exist in a different constituencies i mean in these files of the mio school you see this deepest continuity i mean the same file Uh, has a paper in 47 uh, june 47 and and the same files and continues uh, with september 47 and the same papers which say west punjab then gradually start saying punjab pakistan you know what i'm saying so you see that sort of a change kind of you know if you have a, a kind of a time lapse photography of these images you see kind of a successive shift it wasn't a total break so we in art history has imagined and kind of a, a you know a break between the colonial and the post you know the colonial and the national colonial and the modern fine arts and the craft so all of that has actually i think contributed uh, to uh, you know uh, to disrespect to these material artifacts of history that we have in the archive finally if i have you Minutes, two minutes. Yeah, Nadim sir, little bit about your Raval Pindi, uh, how you built that. Look, uh, I, I mean, <laughs> I left my sort of a, a, a academic career, threw it away. Actually, you know, just abandoned it, and then I joined. I, I applied for an administrative position and set up a college that was, uh, you know, didn't set it. Indeed. So uh, that was just an administrative job that uh, I, I had much to offer. Okay. Uh, so sir, of, on, what, uh, let's wind up with whatever you wanted to say. I thought you know you had set up an argument. Okay. In in fact, you know, I, I just wanted to uh, just flag this uh, for the discussion and the discussants uh, that uh, you know the archive, uh, you know the archive. we at now take archive uh, kind of assume archive as an institution as an institution which has always existed it's like a like a library that we go to we do not realize that the archive uh, uh, in its uh, in its essence so to say if i am allowed to use this strategic essentialism that archive uh, in essence is is a body of control you know it's a 
So it's a, it's a, uh, and the colonial archive uh, was actually the primary technology of control. It is only in our uh, kind of hindsight that we approach archive unproblematically. I mean, archive was a very sinister place in India. You know what I mean? So what I'm saying, okay, imagine uh, these, all these confidential records, which were most of these bureau bureaucratic records, well, like the official statements of truths, you know, which were kept and concealed and, and provided only uh, to the authorized uh, sort of, uh, you know, bodies. It is only when the archives become more like a library with an open access that it loses that sort of, uh, you know, sting and its role as a technology of power. So, so I, I think most of these, uh, uh, you know, histories of the archive that I have seen, they always start uh, in India and in Pakistan. They always start from the British idea of the archives, as is the British idea of the archive was invented from nowhere. You know, as a technology of rule, it has, you know, has a prehistory in the Mughal administration and so on. I mean, so much of Mughal ad administration and its revenue categories were adopted in the colonial administration, that so was the archive. But we again see these disconnect again between the pre-colonial and the colonial and the post. So I think this kind of histories of discontinuities have created a very disjointed view of our history, which needs to be corrected. So that's my kind of general position. It's interesting. Yesterday we had, uh, you know, several archivists from Australia. And they described the archives as a place of trauma which erased massacres and genocides of their communities. So it was, it was interesting how I hadn't thought of the NC archive in those terms. Uh, <laughs> I mean, one thinks of colonial archives like that, but not the NCA. Now, before we want to uh, you know, give Ali a chance to talk, a small anecdote from the NCA archives. So while I was there, I would trail behind Nadeem Saab and he would say, they were, it was time of Ramzan, still uh, this time, uh, Bottles of soda were brought into the archive room for the guests from India to drink. And then another thing the Indian guest was looking for was trails of Bhagat Singh. And lo and behold, you know what was brought for me? Bhagat Singh's FIR. The original FIR of Bhagat Singh. Uh, was, I saw that in the NCA archive. Anyway, so, uh, and that was because one of Nadeem Saab's student purloined it from another museum to bring it to show it to me. <laughs> That's true, from the police museum. Yes, it came from, police museum was still being built behind the thing. So he bought it from there and there was a phone call and standing under the tree, it's raining. Can you come? In? So, you know, it was just like I could write a whole drama on it. But uh, <laughs> that was this little anecdote from the NCA. Now, uh, over to... Yeah, we go to Ali and uh, Ali Usman Kasmi. You have about 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah. thank you so much. It's uh, so nice to connect with, with you and other colleagues. And like everyone else, I would uh, start off by, by sharing anecdotes because I think working in an archive, it can be a really frustrating experience, but a very rewarding experience as well. Not just in terms of what you find, but the way uh, you tend to develop a kind of links and relationships with the people who are working there. Uh, and one of the, the, the person that we, I don't know if he encountered that person directly, but there's a administrative position of, of a weeding officer, which I thought is the person who provide weed or something, but the, actually the weeding officer exists to, to destroy uh, documents. And, 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 you know, it, it, it happened that some of the, the, the very useful files, which, which I thought were really crucial and they should have been preserved, uh, I was later told that they have been destroyed by, by the weeding officer. And, uh, the, and the other experience was that uh, one, one of the files which I requested uh, from 1890s or something, it, it said confidential. And the, the, uh, the, the consent officer refused to share it with me saying that these are confidential files. So, I mean, there is this, uh, the, the way the, the, the archival sort of uh, staff, uh, administrative staff has, has uh, internalized some of the, the, the language of the, the archive, which was meant to be operative for the time period in which they came into existence. And I think some of it is, is reflected in the, in the introduction to the archive, which has been published. There are various pamphlets which are published by the Punjab archive. I have a collection of them and I've got them bounded. 
and there is one which is about the rules regulating the access of the the public to the archives of the Punjab government. And the start, I, I I presume that this is still the operative part uh, of of rules uh, applicable. And it, the the very first point is that the public have no right to inspect or to have copies of records in the possession of of government. And if you have to apply for any access or to get records, you have to provide your domicile, proof of residence, occupation, a detailed, uh, you know, explanation as to why you want to, to get inside. And if you are, are a foreigner, then you have to apply, have to go apply to the Ministry of Interior via your diplomatic office in, in Islamabad, and only then it will be considered. So, I mean, the as uh, Nadeem Saab was pointing out in the beginning, and I remember, I mean, I, I, I know when Nadeem Saab started working on it, I was uh, a graduate student. I was doing my BA at Government College and we used to, to visit um, the NCA and we saw the material lying around and I was trying to, to sift through it and make sense of it. Um, so we, we know, you know, how, the, how he has, you know, has, has built, this, uh, uh, built this institution. And as he was pointing out, you know, the, 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 post, the, the, the law which, um, or the administrative procedure which uh, is applicable in case of, of these archives. So I think uh, the, the part relating to law is, is important as to how the language of law relating with the archives, the management of records, the collection of record shapes the outcome of that uh, archive um, as well. And here I would like to say that archives are not simply meant for scholarly work, they function a number of other uh, other other projects as well. So, for example, in Islamabad, I remember working at the National um, Archives, and some of, and in fact, I was surprised that many people would visit. And I thought that, I mean, so certainly with so much of research activity going on, and it turned out people come here because some of them they need to to see a gazette notification of their appointment in order to get their pensions. Some of them they are migrants from. Uh, uh, from from Kashmir, and they have some legal claims, land claims, um, and for that they need access to to certain documents. Right? So there is the 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 law itself is going to be applicable, is extremely important. Now I come to the point where uh, I would I would like to introduce um, a digital archive at Lums, which we have put together. My my colleague Dr. Ali Raza and I, and I had been working on it, and at the moment we have four to five different collections that we have made available now, briefly as to why it's important. I mean, partially it's, you know, everyone knows how difficult it is to access government ar archives and it's not necessarily because the art, uh, the archivists are uncooperative. I have find uh, archivists in, in Punjab archives or Islamabad and DC to be very helpful. I mean, they try to be as helpful as possible. It's just that there, there are, there aren't enough resources. The, the catalogs are not properly maintained. So even if they want to help you, they won't be able to help you because the record is not simply there. The, the second bigger the problem is that the state in Pakistan, the Pakistani state narrative uh, has a very specific kind of historical agenda. So it's a very peculiar kind of a, of a timeline of, uh, of how the history proceeds in a very theological manner. And if you want to do that kind of history, it is, it's, it's very, very easy. And I've said this before, I repeat that, that if you want to work on, on, on the history of Muslim League or the two nation theory, it's extremely easy. You simply go to national archives, all the relevant record dealing with uh, uh, Jinnah papers, Muslim League papers, provincial records, district level records of the Muslim League, all of them have been photocopied and they are in the general reading room. You can just pick them off the shelf and start reading it. Fatma Jinnah papers, for example. So I have the catalog of all these papers. But if you want to work on anything else, it's, it's then it becomes extremely problematic. A, the archive is designed in a manner that it's only catering with an official version of the history. And the scope of documentation is extremely narrow. For them, it's not really a concern as to uh, you know, how to accommodate you know, micro histories, subaltern histories, and, and other such stuff. So, uh, so if you are interested in that kind of uh, if you have this kind of an approach towards history, then, you know, as Aisha Jalal says, then you have to, in case of Pakistan, you have to create your own archive. 
And many of my colleagues here and historians who work in Pakistan have actually done that. They have created their own archives working with numerous private collectors um, and, and people who have their own libraries and they are wonderful people and they, they have extensive collections of their own, which tells you how history is extremely important for people. That's part of their everyday conversation. They derive their identities through it. It's, uh, and it's part of a larger political struggle as well. And that's why these digital archives, community archives records, they exist and why they are so generous and they, they want to, to, to share. So we started off with this presumption that people who are doing their PhDs, once they are done with their, with their, with their PhDs, they have published their book, their articles, Let's approach them, let's ask them, like, why don't you share your work, your, your, your material with us? I mean, so for, so, so for instance, um, uh, I started, uh, I was working on the Ahmadi issue, and there is uh, a stash of documents which I found in the Punjab archives, which was uncatalogued, was dumped in a corner. And once I had uh, finished my work, I got, them, I, I got them photocopied, scanned. So now we have it on our, uh, on our website, for example. The biggest, uh, and let me just show you the, um, our, our, uh, our, our, our page. I, I hope you can, I'm uh, sharing my, my screen with you. And uh, so, yeah. So you can see that this, the, uh, uh, the, the digital LUMS, uh, LUMS digital archive has some featured projects on it. The biggest project right now is the partition testimonies collected by Professor Ishtiak Ahmed for his book which is an award-winning book on, uh, on refugee uh, you know, uh, experiences across the border. And for his project, he had interviewed literally like hundreds of people. Most of them are now, are now dead. And on both sides of the border, in fact, uh, in other parts of, uh, of the world as well. So if you go through this, um, this material, these are all the, uh, the, the interviews that he had conduct conducted. Now, Ali Raza, he, he, he got funding, he got them digitally cleaned. He invested a lot of time and energy preparing an extensive metadata as well for all these interviews so that you know, when you scroll, scroll down, you know like at, at which part of the interview, what is being talked about so that it's searchable. So if you are, let's say, interested in what was happening, if you're interested in the testimony of someone from Jalandhar, from Kapoorthala, from Amritsar, from Gujranwala, so you know uh, which interview to listen to. Uh, so it, that's, I mean, that's the level of, of detail which goes into curating uh, a project. It's not simply putting it together out there in a digitized manner. It's also how you put it out there to make it more accessible uh, for researchers, for others who are interested. Uh, similarly, you know, the, uh, we, we received a donation from uh, Julian, uh, who is a French scholar and a fiction writer. So he's working on Punjabi journals. And he made, uh, for his, his research, he scanned copies of Punjabi journals. Now, Punjabi being a marginalized language in Pakistan, you do not have an extensive repository of Punjabi journals published, uh, which have been in publication since the 1950s and 60s. So we have them all scanned, put them online, give a brief introduction about each of, uh, of these journals, and uh, uh, it's, it's available. Similarly, I, like I said, I, uh, we have the, the NT Ahmadiyya record. And, uh, and then uh, there's a recent edition of, uh, of uh, a project. It's, part, it's come out of my teaching. Uh, uh, I was teaching a course on the history of Lahore, uh, where walking as a method, you know, as to how you, if you walk in the city, uh, what kind of, uh, how you explore the city and how the city speaks to you. And, uh, and as part of this, this project, you were, there, there are different themes. And I, I think I'll just focus on one of the themes, one of the projects, it's about two murders, two trials, which is, which deals with the legacy, life and legacy of Bhagat Singh and Ilamdi. Like Bhagat Singh, Bhagat Singh as this iconic revolutionary figure and Ilamdi as person who is remembered in Pakistan for his uh, heroic act of killing a blasphemer. And both of them young in their, you know, late, uh, nine, uh, late teens, early twenties, how they were politically motivated, charged, and they were involved in, 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 a, in, a, in an act of radical politics whereby Bhagat Singh stood for revolution, uh, Ilam Deen for something else. Both of them grew up in Lahore, almost lived in the same area and uh, the trials took place in Lahore. They had a very similar outcome. And, uh, and all this material was then provided by uh, Abbas Chokhai Saab who's very, very cooperative. And if you go through 
the um, uh, you know uh, again the the, uh, the projects have, and it's all being done by our by our students and you will see how we have collected uh, extensive material from the from the archives and made it available and it tells you a lot about the extent to which you know the again the archive as um, is a repository of of not something which is primarily for uh, for future research. It is a legal archive that we are talking about, and you must have seen. And you was we were referring to the the FIR reports of, of the, the original FIR of Bhagat Singh. I mean the 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 record for Bhagat Singh it's so immense. There was I mean if you go through the details, there is even um, you know a catalog of, of books that were being issued by the revolutionaries and through the reading habits. The British were trying to establish a case of subversion, of uh, of sedition, right? The the, the fact that uh, the people were reading a certain text, and we find continuities of of that in present day, perhaps India and Pakistan as well. Where if uh, I think in India as well, recently there was a ban in some part of of saying Lal Salam. Similarly, in Balochistan, they found students with copies of of Lenin and uh, other such material and that the possession of that material itself becomes an act of subversion. So, so how that archive is then not just meant for scholarly historical purposes, it's basically uh, a legal record. It's a, uh, it was collected primarily for the purposes of, uh, of, uh, of conducting a trial of people who were charged with, uh, with a crime uh, back, back then, right? So, so these are some of the activities through which we thought there can be a lot of uh, interest in, uh, in, in, you know, in, in how students can and general leaders, you know, uh, interested in history can relate to some of the, the material which is, uh, which is available and that it becomes a method in itself for, for understanding as to, uh, as to, to how, it, how, how things were functioning. And, uh, and, and lastly, I mean, if you have, uh, do I have a couple of minutes or should I wait for? Um... Go ahead, Ali. Okay, so uh, yeah, so, and, and lastly, there is uh, a, an ongoing project, which again, you know, it's, it's one of uh, the major uh, ambitious projects that we have, and which is about, uh, about mapping violence, uh, uh, mapping violence, which took place in 1947, with a particular focus on the abduction of women on, on both sides. Now the numbers, the official numbers are close to 80,000. And so far we have been able to, to have access to a record of almost 12 to 15,000 of, of women. And the idea is that if we can map it on to, uh, you know, the areas, as it will develop a kind of, of clusters of red zones, which will tell you because the data which is available is so extensive it gives you precise information of who the woman was, uh, uh, where was she abducted from, her caste, her husband's name, her father's name, the name of the abductee, his caste, his, his present address, his, you know, so which tells you that even the, the abduction process as we have traditionally understood was not a random act. The women knew and the families knew who has abducted them. Right. So if we can achieve this kind of, of level, level of, um, of mapping, it will reveal extensively as to how violence actually took place in 1947 at the very, you know, uh, basic level of, uh, of, uh, of village of Mohalla. And uh, why is it then on the basis of that, we can imagine as to why is it that there's more abductions happening, let's say in Amritsar and Patiala and in Shekhupura or Gujarat, but not in other parts of, of Punjab, but the, you know, so that's a very, uh, th that's an ongoing project, which is, which is an ambitious project because unlike, let's say, Holocaust studies, which are very specialized, which you have a lot of funding, which you have people working, uh, you have people who have PhDs working as, as, as researchers. We, on the other hand, in South Asia, do not have a similar level of, um, of expertise available. So you mostly have to work with undergrad students or, uh, or other researchers, access to data is difficult. Identifying places is, 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 a, is a task. And um, uh, to, to make it more collaborative on both sides, that is a challenge in itself uh, as well, because you know, then uh, maps become, um, uh, again, uh, some kind of a highly sensitive kind of, uh, of a document. Uh, and to be able to, to, to have access to uh, how village level distribution 
has changed in case of india becomes an impossibility for someone in pakistan and vice versa so so on the whole this is uh, why we started working on a digital archive what are the basic uh, themes in which we are interested and what are the base main major hurdles that we face in carrying out our uh, project especially with regard to digital humanities thank you ali that was a brilliant you know sort of detailed website now i have a quick question before we sort of open up it open this up for other others and is this website accessible from delhi oh yes it's uh, it's completely accessible um, and uh, all all our material is 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 open open to public and uh, yeah and what are the possibilities of collaboration if scholars from india wanted to add material to this without the maps the sensitive issue of maps leaving that aside is we'll there be a very happy i mean we that's what i mean some of the some of our colleagues have promised us that some you know working on on um, leftist movements or that they they collected a lot of pamphlets and they said we'll later on be sharing it with you we now have a proper system now we know the drill as to how to collect it how to curate it how to you know a uh, catalog material so if someone from uh, from india wants to to share their archives with us we'll be extremely happy to to put it online yeah so ha have you heard about the partition archive which has come up in amritsar uh the the partition archive in amritsar then there is uh, uh the the one in stanford and so yeah i mean they have their own ways of 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 working with it i mean they at some point were willing to especially the one at uh, stanford california were willing to provide access but then um, i mean uh, i don't know where the uh, with the with the project currently stands but uh, but their idea is to 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 have a limited access and i mean i i understand the reasons because it's a very sensitive because it can i mean that's one question that it 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 can be potentially misused the yeah. sensitivity of of details are such that uh, if the person using it is not sort of uh, initiated into understanding as to what is being shared it can be exploited by by a certain right wing groups on both sides okay and another quick question about language so this website is in English, like what went into deciding what language the for the language for the website and i saw that some of the documents were in uh, nastalik so okay. how, is there a translation process within the website how do you go about doing managing the language issue the the easiest for us is to always start with uh, with english because that's the language in which it's easier for um, you know to do all sorts of different codings and uh, to to provide access although we we have you know so that was the major you know arrangement with our designers that you know you keep it open in, in a in a manner that in, in in future if you want to add more languages or more fonts it should be uh, it should be possible yes yeah, so that possibility is is always there so does the website translate the document for the reader no no no, no. that is um, i don't know if it uh, was written in shamukhi it is that's not the way people on this side of the border read punjabi they read it in gurumukhi right so that, that is uh, you know there, there is there are uh, softwares which the the punjabi university patiala is developing it's not uh, it's not 100% i mean it's it's getting there but it's um, only i don't and if, i don't know if it's applicable on published material or printed material it's i think if you type something and you want to convert it right away i think the conversion happens there not otherwise okay but maybe that would be something to think about on um, you know enhancing the accessibility because one is being able to go and click on the website but then if i can't read it if i can't read the primary source then um, you know it's sometimes quite frustrating yeah. so uh, yeah okay so we are having some questions like the audience is posting some questions but before we take that i had a few questions that are of my own to ask so um kamal ji this question was for you you know uh, yesterday the archivists we had from as i've been telling you about the community archives they were primarily women and they brought this whole idea of archives being gendered spaces uh to us that the archive really documents the male voice in some way because the administrators tend to be mostly male the record keepers tend to be male and women's voices or women working in the archives are few and far between so what is what has been your experience uh, working in that domain especially as a south asian woman 
And uh, yeah, so that, and also something about the digitization of the records. Somebody in the audience sent me a private message asking me about that. What about the Mughal records up till 1858? Can they access it from India? Uh, when it comes to the gender discrimination, um, I don't think so. I've ever, if you talk about my personal experience, never ever in my uh, research career that I've come across this kind of attitude that as if I've been discriminated being a woman. On the other hand, uh, there are times when uh, we, being the South Asian women, uh, we are very well respected. So I've been very well facilitated. And when it comes to the photocopying and, and even the tea is being served very politely, very lovingly. And uh, many a times uh, I have shared the lunch with the different employees of uh, different archives and libraries. So that has never, I, I never, never ever experienced that. And in the same uh, way, whenever some female scholars are coming to us and the interesting part of the whole scenario is much of the historians and all the art historians, let me be more specific about it. I was teaching a PhD class, uh, or rather I've been teaching PhD classes for quite some time. Trust me, I think 99% uh, of the students are the females there. So we've, it's, uh, it's rare that we come across a male student. So that tells you how the situation is in Pakistan. Saying this, this is uh, the research. Just when it comes to the employees, um, uh, Punjab archives have many female employees. But the fact is that I am the first ever female director of Punjab archives. That is another story. But of course, uh, since the record is all associated with the, most of the time with the male uh, you know, uh, bureaucrats and civil servants and all that. So that is primarily dominated with the males. That is a fact because the, the meetings and all those decisions were made by them. So um, no gender discrimination at all in our part of the, uh, the region. Uh, we, uh, the, yeah, the digitization, yes, this, um, concept uh, has been brewing for quite some time within the, the archives and there have been many people associated to it. And then there was a proposal that was being approved by the government of our, uh, Punjab. And of course, uh, our governments never had any priority for the culture and all that, but this time it was quite an exception and they were given quite an excessive uh, budget for the digitization of uh, some of the collection of Punjab archives. And uh, it has been in process for the past three years. And this was done with the collaboration of uh, uh, Pakistan uh, Information and Technology Board, that is PITB. So they are the ones who are giving the technical expertise and the archives are the people they are providing the data and all that. Uh, initially, it has been decided that there'll be more than 500,000 uh, documents and these are, I think, approximately 32,000 files that will be uh, uh, digitized. And then there will be a board web page. And that is also being uh, designed and all that. So, uh, and from through, through that web page, uh, the, the scholars from all over the world, they will have access to those documents. Uh, but uh, to tell you something very honestly, this is still a thing of the future, but it has already been uh, in its executional process. This is not something that has been dreaming about. It has already been uh, in process. Uh, we have, in fact, we have done more than uh, a digital, uh, more than 100,000 pages has been uh, scanned and all that. And these are high resolution uh, scan documents. And there will be a proper process of accessing these documents. Uh, coming to another point that has been raised here again and again, that is thanks to the data. Of course, when the uh, to get to the access, um, since I've been also been part of uh, the museum and now the archives, one thing I must share here, and this is what has been very really rightly pointed out by Mr. Usma, uh, Ali Usma, that uh, it depends on the sensitivity of the data, and then it depends on who uh, can be given access to that. When it comes to the serious scholars on the researchers, this is another thing. But if the data has been you know, uh, provided to someone who is not exactly very really sensitive to it, so that can be uh, quite problematic at times. Because of course we do, as researchers, as scholars, we all know we come across so many 
uh, so many info, so much of an information that can be, uh, you know, that can be difficult to, uh, uh, you know, give it to public and all that. So keeping in mind that kind of basic uh, sensitivity. Now, if you look at it, of course, there are some forms to be filled by the job archives, but uh, the scholars, whenever they come here, and since I'm here for quite some time now, they have been facilitated and they have been given the data and um, whatever information is available. Uh, another point, the, the readers, I'm surprised that uh, the readers, can, they cannot destroy the document. They do not have any authority to do that. So this is a kind of, uh, because when I went to the museum, people told me, oh, they were registered, they were being burnt. But then, so there are so many stories associated to our uh, depositories. And there is one more thing here that I must share. When it comes to sharing the data or the information, I don't know about India, but in Pakistan, I have faced it many times. Let it be a library or a personal collection or an archive or a museum, uh, there was lots of resistance that was be, that is always being faced by the scholars. I don't know, this is some kind of a mindset. I don't know what it is all about. But now, now like Nadeem Saab and uh, Ali Saab and hopefully me, uh, will be able to facilitate the future scholars the way they should be. But uh, resistance of uh, giving away any kind of information, uh, it's there, it is still there. And you just need to find ways and means to handle that. But saying this, again, I'm saying to you that archives, um, as long as I'm there, I'm sure Nadeem Saab, Ali Saab, whenever you come to us for any kind of information, we will try our level best. And Aparna, hopefully you do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, Kamalji, since we are talking, the one aspect we have not covered is the Lahore Museum. And oh, yeah. uh, you have been there, you were in charge of the painting collection there. Now, we had a quick question from the audience about are there any record collections also there? And very briefly, if you can tell us what all is there in Lahore Museum, even for archaeologists, because I know that there is a lot of collection there, there's a lot of painting there. You are absolutely right. There are lots of paintings there and the painting collection is primar primarily divided in two parts. One is a miniature painting and the other one is the contemporary painting collection. And we have, uh, you can, uh, the whole museum has, you could call the textbook paintings, which are being the, you know, uh, the, uh, the turning points in the art history and all that. Yes, they have that. And uh, when it comes to the other collections, of course, you are familiar, they have got a wonderful Coins collection and the uh, collection that they have. But apart, apart from that, they have some very interesting manuscripts as well. But unfortunately, like all the institutions of Pakistan, we need to have all these things uh, accessible online, which is, uh, to tell you honestly, seems like a long process. So I cannot promise you that people will have an access tomorrow or next year, or maybe, I don't know, for after how many years. But yes, the data is there. And uh, there are people who are uh, there to facilitate you. There is one point I must make here. At times, uh, random public, they come to us because we are uh, dealing with every kind of, uh, you know, people coming from every class and all that. But there are times when um, things are made slightly more difficult so that uh, only those who are serious about it can get connected to the relevant data or the document or the painting that they're looking for. Because sometimes people used to come to me at Lahore Museum and they, uh, they would say, okay, we want to see the Sikh paintings. Okay, which Sikh painting, any particular genre, what you, or, or to be more precise, they wanted to see the whole collection of the paintings lying uh, inside the museum. So uh, if you want to access to some particular data, be more precise, be more logical about it, because you just cannot walk in and ask uh, any archi archivist to show me the record of uh, a colonial British period in India. So that is like a history of almost 100 years. So yeah, these are the kind of measures you need to take before accessing museums and archives. Uh, 
So we have another question from a researcher, a scholar of Rajasthan. He's asking whether we have records of princely states, which are no longer in Pakistan now, but were part of that region at one point in time. Are those available? And are there records other than Persian and English? Are there any languages in, are there records in any other languages that are available? Uh, first question is about the princely states. Uh, if uh, he would name me, then maybe I will be able to re, uh, tell them uh, more precisely because we do have some record about the princely states during the Pakistani princely states. Rajasthani, if uh, if I could get the names, and then maybe I can help them because this is a very broad term of Rajasthani princely states. So maybe. If uh, I get the name that uh, if, if he wants to have some particular information about some particular state, then I can check it out and I can uh, get back to him. And uh, the other question was uh, regarding what are other the languages of the record? Yes, yes. Uh, for the rec uh, record, we have some uh, record in Urdu, and uh, some of it is in uh, Gurmukhi as well. But uh, it's in a very small number, hardly a few pages or things. Or rather, in some file, there are some notification that has been issued either in, uh, in Urdu, in Shamukhi, or in Gurmukhi, or in Sanskrit as well. So, okay. uh, so the, the number is very limited. So the primarily the record is either in uh, Persian or in English. OK. Now, here is a question for Ali. We have in the audience a person who represents the Partition Museum. So, and her name is Priyanka. And she wanted to know how did you arrive at the transcription approach, timestamps, keywords, et cetera. And if you could speak a bit about the Ishtia Kemat collection and the digitization process. Yes, so basically, Dr. Ali Raza was uh, taking care of, um, of, of uh, you know, a digitization process. Like I said, uh, the idea was to first get them uh, digitally cleaned as well to make it, make them more audible because he had conducted uh, uh, interviews at different sites at times there are like uh, some um, some background noises which had to be cancelled out and then we had to listen to the entire entire interview to to figure out as to what are the, the key issues areas themes which are being uh, which are being discussed so yeah, so mainly, I mean, uh, since I was not directly involved in uh, in the transcription process, I don't know uh, much, but uh, but that's the, the, the broad uh, themes, that's that's how we go, uh, went about it. Okay. Now, Kasmi, uh, sorry, Nadeem Sa, um, so, and somebody in the audience has asked this question about the, uh, well, that in Rawalpindi, you were uh, helping preserve this Haveli Sujan Singh. So can you share some details about that? You, uh, Rahul Pindi was mainly, you started uh, preservation of heritage sites. So the, today's talk is not only about the paper archive or the object archive, but also heritage, because that forms community knowledge, community preservation. So could you just tell right. us something about that? Uh, yes, I mean, uh, I mean, if you think of historical preservation uh, in Pakistan, I mean, that, uh, you know, kind of physical act of preservation is intimately connected with memories of the past, you know, the forgotten memories. Uh, you know, all those people uh, who, who actually, who, who were somebody, let's say, the 447 in their area, became complete strangers after 47 for the, uh, for the succeeding generation. I mean, this particular Haveli called Sujan Singh Haveli uh, is attributed to a, a very, a, you know, a, probably, you know, somebody who is, uh, you know, the almost the iconic name in the rather history of Raval Pindi. He was a greatest philanthrop. He was a contractor, a sick contractor, and a, and a great philanthrop of Raval Pindi. Uh, and without having any state, he was actually given... Uh, the status uh, equal to the, you know, the, to the princely statesman or, you know, it's a very highly respected. He wasn't part of the landed gentry. He was part of the business elite, if you like. And he worked under the British, uh, with the British army. Now that particular Haveli, 
was one of the monumental structures of the of 19th century uh, Rawalpindi. 19th century Rawalpindi, and if you look at the fabric of the of the building, uh, it had all the uh, materials imported from Europe. Right, so you would see. The, uh you know it was you know the indian architecture was blended into this european modern furnishing uh, if you like and uh, and and it was so majestic and it was so you know elaborate in every sense of the word uh, if you look at the kitchen uh, kitchen will have so many kind of functional spaces for uh, so many different ways of uh, preparing the meal and serving it and so on so but all that uh was ruined uh, especially after partition and because uh, largely because i think it became uh, kind of it was kind of swallowed in by the by the constructions all around it so its access was blocked the biggest trouble in conservation or for its ownership to any other you know sort of a potential a sort of a client if you like because we wanted to make it functional like a heritage museum for potohar you know potohar in punjab is a carries a distinct cultural identity which goes back to thousand years so but potohar as a cultural sort of unit is not recognized or not given the kind of importance and rawalpindi being it's one of the uh, major kind of centers uh, established around 16th century onwards Uh, so i think uh, could have uh, uh, you know have a museum and this was a place which i really suited for it so uh, in partnership with an you know sort of american university we did worked out you know some level of uh, kind of detail required before the actual conservation process could begin but then for a number of reason this project was kind of wind up and uh, this sujan singh haveri uh, you know kind of went back to its uh, you know ruinous condition and i have been disengaged from it now for like 3 4 years uh, but it is a, it's a tragic loss of cultural history it's a tragic loss for the urban fabric of the city uh, the the building had those features which were extraordinary you know the kind of uh, it it is you know not exactly but it is quite comparable to that famous sethi haveli of peshawar which uh, had received around uh, i mean i don't know hundreds of millions of rupees for the preservation in peshawar but uh, sadly because uh, rawalpindi uh, within rawalpindi there is very little cultural ownership had this building been in lahore with this lahore in the very active nationalist intelligentsia you know which for which uh, historical preservation is a, is a very live vein you know is a live field for them for for people rawal pindi i don't know it's a backyard of the industrial complex or whatever issues that it has uh, has very little ownership of the culture of the city so question has snapped yeah so it's sort of uh, you know it's interesting who is the past for who do who preserves and often it's a sort of the preservation of past is also a bourgeois exercise for the middle classes the people who are not in the class relate to the past and their built heritage in a very different way and this sort of reminds me of um, you know i had done a tour of that or uh, in uh, am i audible is it going fine okay yes uh, in uh, in uh, old lahore in arkali where aga khan trust had done this preservation and redone all those houses so i visited many of those houses and people inside and aga khan trust was trying his best to sort of restore that area it was done beautifully but because it is in lahore it got done in a particular way and other interesting i i follow this one uh, instagram handle called purana pakistan and it had posted on haveli uh, the haveli that you are talking about the haveli so jansing it had done a small series of photographs on it and then its history 
so it's very interesting people are interested so uh, okay now uh, one of our uh, members of the audience who's a professor at jindal university swati chavla would like to ask a question so i'm uh, swati if you're there and if you can open your yes. audio hi am i audible yes Okay, great. Uh, thank you. So I have a just a couple of comments and a quick question uh, for Ali. First of all, that was absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, and also the anecdotes that you started with about the Vedas, for example. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there is I mean, just a lot, lot more to be said there. Uh, I'm sure. And also, thank you for reminding us that the archives as a space are not just for historians, for professional or card-carrying historians, but that the archives are also living spaces and they are activated uh, by claimants of various kinds uh, and they house records of various kinds that are, um, that are relevant uh, you know, in a bread and butter way to people's lives in the present moment. And I think that's a very useful um, it's a very useful reminder. And I also wanted to sort of use that to push back. Um, again, something that Kamal was saying, because you, uh, Kamal, you stressed a couple of times that these are spaces for serious researchers. And I was wondering if, uh, you know, what is really gained from holding this distinction between a serious researcher or say a hobbyist or someone who's just I don't know, gallivanting around walks into the archives and wants to access a record if these are matters of public record. So I, I wonder what we gain from holding on to that distinction. Uh, but my question to Ali is, uh, and this is uh, again a bread and butter question, you know, you're housed in a university and you mentioned that the, uh, the digital archive at LUMS, it's uh, that you involve students in it, particularly undergrad students they are not experienced researchers. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about that, the course, for example, walking in the city, uh, you know, what percentage of that course uh, is this putting together of the archive, you know, how are you grading it, for example, how are students participating, um, what exactly are they doing, how does it uh, carry on from one semester to the other, I mean, are you teaching it, say, every fall, in which case what happens in the intervening six to nine months? Are students involved in it, uh, you know, across different courses? Do they keep coming back to the archive? So I was wondering if you could speak a little to that because it's something we want to do at Jindal as well, involve students in the building of an archive uh, and undergrads. So I was uh, just also selfishly interested uh, in knowing some best practices and lessons from there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, um, I'm, you know, really grateful for your for your comments. As for um, the, the course is concerned, so that thankfully we were able to do it in in fall um, last year, and uh, it involved. Uh, ideally, uh, at some point, I would like to do it as a year long exercise because four months is just not enough to to cover um, an entire city like Lahore. And so we were only focusing on very selected areas. So for example, the walled city. So as part of the project, the entire assessment was based on what they are, uh, the students were able to produce in terms of uh, different projects that were assigned to them. So there were two major projects. One was the, the curated uh, histories, social cultural histories of various movements of various revolutionary movements uh, um, and another kind of uh, thematic um, focus. The other one was uh, making um, an app for the walled city. So the focus was only on, on the walled city because that's a more restricted kind of an area. So we made frequent trips to the walled city and we were helped by and guided by a young uh, scholar named Faizan Abbas. Now, as you were referring to uh, the point of like, what's the point of specialized research? So Faizan Abbas is a self-taught young man under 30 who knows the city like the back of his hand. And he actually was telling us what to do and where to find different uh, uh, buildings, sites, sites which have uh, in, in depleted, uh, depleted kind of uh, conditions, uh, torn down, not anyone, no, not really anyone knows about them. And yet he knows their history, their location. So he was the cornerstone of all these different efforts. And so we assigned different gates to a group of students who, uh, who were asked to, to list major sites, historical, cultural, and then gather data from uh, published classical histories of Lahore, for example, Dehikate Chishti, 
uh, Kanaiya Lal's uh, Tariq e Lahore and other, other such stuff. And then uh, to identify and to, to pin them on, on a Google map. So how, that's how we have collected all, all, all the different data. The, we collaborated with students from, uh, uh, and, and faculty from the, the computer science department. Uh, two of their students, they uh, designed the, the, the app. So all the data was added to that uh, um, app. And uh, now we're in the, in the process of, we, we would have launched it last month, but you know, obviously things uh, were stopped in between. Uh, so we will be double checking all, all this information and especially the locations. So, so now anyone who wants to explore can, can use that app. It will guide you through different gates and different locations in the walled city. And that was one way in which students got introduced to the city because the idea was that it's such a, 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 there's such a class division when it comes to living in the city. It's, it's not even that we live in the same city. Uh, you live in cantonment areas, gated communities, and your idea of the city is then uh, reduced to cafes and uh, you know uh, you know going to various um, shops and uh, doing shopping there and going to the walled city so one of the very interesting comments which uh, was made uh, in, you know by a student while he was carrying out his research was that when he went to the walled city uh, someone referred to him as a as a pardesi um, and he was shocked he said like i have lived all my life in lahore and he, he calls me pardesi an outsider who someone who don't, doesn't live here, but that's, I mean, actually true because there is such, such, a, such a class division. So there was an encounter which was very, very useful for the students. They got to know the problems. This is not an idealization or romanticization of the walled city. It's not to be reduced to a site of heritage, which is for consumption, which is to be uh, you know, improved upon by the Aga Khan Trust. It's about the everyday lives of the people and their interactions. Um, so that's the that, that's the it's kind of the methodological approach, um, and there were various problems. There were problems of organizing trips, of getting funding from the university, which was being very helpful, um, and um, and you know navigating through very dense spaces, which are not always very very friendly towards women. So with all these different kind of um, kind of challenges, and that's where uh, uh, that's what we were. Uh, that's what we were doing, and then uh, for the projects, students were mostly working in uh, in the in the archives. So again, I mean, if you, uh, I forgot to show, or uh, if you just give me one, you know, thirty seconds, I just wanted to share, uh, for example, some of the archival material which they had collected. So for again, for the Bhagat, because Bhagat Singh is a superstar, and everyone is interested in Bhagat Singh. This is, for example, Bhagat Singh Bhagat Singh's escape route, as to how he has escaped after he has shot. Saunders. So, so with our you know team of uh, uh, IT experts from uh, from a local firm, so they mapped it onto you know uh, uh, in in this way. So you can actually follow his his footsteps as to where the shooting took place. Then he you know ran towards the Court Street, and you know and then into this uh, a DAV College from DAV College uh, into their hostel uh, into a volleyball ground and. You know, so this is this putting it out in this fashion makes it more uh, understandable, makes, makes it more interesting, helps you envision uh, the spaces within which such a rich history and politics was, uh, was played out. So this was at least what we were trying to do in, in, in our course. Thank you, Ali, for that. Uh, Swati, maybe you need to collaborate with us in Ashoka and get all our students to do this course together and you know, I just got a message from one of my undergrads who, who's listening in saying, Professor, yeah. we must do this. So yes, we, we must do it. it. Yes. And we must get Ali over and his students. Yeah. Well, Ali has come over and created enough trouble for me uh, oh. with the Tulipat police, but uh, we should have him over again. Yes. More okay. trouble. Sorry, Swati, yes. I just said more trouble, sorry. Yes, so uh, what I'm gonna do now is we have uh, four participants who, would who I would just open the floor to, who would like to ask you questions. And we would like to wind up in next 10 minutes because we're already overshooting our time. We can go forward like we have, it's not the Zoom problem, but you know. Uh, so um, Rochelle, Rajmani, Mrilanili, and Nonika, in that order, if you could ask your questions to the panelists and interact with them. Rochelle? Are you there still, Roshan? I am. I am. I'm trying to unmute myself. Uh, can you can you hear me? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Can. Okay. Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah. I? Thank you. Uh, can I can I speak? 
Go ahead, Rochelle. Yeah, okay. Thanks very much for like a wonderful panel. It's a real privilege to hear anyone uh, from Pakistan uh, speak. I was just curious about whether there'd ever been collaborations across South Asian governments on any question related to the archives, whether it's Pakistan, Bangladesh, or, you know, India, Pakistan. Because I know there have been collaborations, you know, say with the British Library in London, but uh, I just want to know if there have been South Asian ones. Uh, Nadeem Saab, uh, Kamal Ji. Ji, uh, not exactly a collaboration, but I once had an idea that, as you know, that the collection of the Lahore Museum uh, was distributed between right. India and Pakistan, and a lot of that went to Chandigarh. And uh, out of that, there was a, there's a, you know, kind of a story about a medieval manuscript called Chandain, uh, which was torn into two pieces, right in the middle, you know, let's say for the 100 pages, the 50 pages went to Pakistan and 50 pages went to India. And they were never united. So if you are kind of following it, you can follow only the, you know, it's bits and pieces, you have to travel across the border to actually go to the Get the full story. So one suggestion was that in this digital age, we need to just sort of scan them and bring them together as one digital manuscript. So, so I think uh, I would say that if there were barriers between, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, roadblocks or the barriers between collaboration between two countries for obvious reasons, uh, I think it probably is still possible to work at, in a third space and merge this collection. Lahore Museum has suffered immensely. I mean, all of its collection, uh, uh, you know, a lot of uh, Dr. Sefer Rahman Dar, who was a, who served as a director of the Lahore Museum in the 70s, is a renowned archeologist. He has actually published on the aspects of uh, this collection being separate. So, so we think that this is a, a uh, you know, kind of a possibility for the future that the archivist and the curators uh, should work out the possibilities of sharing hands without actually, you know, actually physically crossing each other's path. So this is very much possible and we should go ahead with this. Thanks. Ali and uh, Kamalji, do you want to come in or shall we move to the next question? I think I should take the next question, perhaps. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. You go ahead? So uh, there is, uh, I don't think I've come across any kind of uh, collaboration that uh, happened between the South Asian countries. And uh, this kind of resistance is everywhere. So I remember when I went to India and the kind of problems that I had to face and uh, at night we were brought into the Thana and how the police while I was street. I mean, that was quite an experience that I, I So these are the kind of apprehensions which are there, which I don't know what and how we are going to deal with. And Aparna, relax. I know that your son is probably sitting. Uh, it's perfectly all right. We are all used to of these kind of things. So just focus on us and he is sitting very calmly. <laughs> so the thing is that the resistance is not one-sided. And the reservation regarding the collaboration and all that, it's everywhere. So there are lots of barriers that need to be uh, overcome. And there is one point here, just a small point I would like to make. It was, I think, Shweta, and uh, she was uh, talking about uh, my term of using the serious scholar. So, uh, and I gave a few examples that there are people who used to visit Lahore Museum with seven children with them and the grown-ups. I do not mind. They are more than welcome to come. And then just by the way, they will walk in my office and then they'll demand they will want to have a look at all the company paintings that we have. So that is the kind of, uh, uh, you know, visitors that uh, we do not call them serious scholars. But when some, uh, whoever comes to us with a very specific demand, the collection is always for them. 
So that, that's my uh, a small follow up question. Uh, you said if you tell the exact states, princely states, you will be able to respond. So even if you don't know now, maybe over email you can tell us later. We would like to know uh, if there are records related to Jodhpur, Bikaner, Jaisalmer. In the okay. country, I'll note it down and then um, I can. Talk about. Okay. But I, uh, at the top of my heart, if I can tell you, uh, let me check it on. But yeah. I so. Uh, but okay, this was Jodhpur, Bikaner, and uh, and uh, Jaisalmer. All right, fine. And uh, if uh, Mr. Rajmani is still there, would you like to come in and ask your question? Uh, Maya, could you check if Mr. Because I can't see everyone. I think he's left. He's left. Okay. So, uh, Nilana Lee, uh, do you want to ask your question if you're still around? And Nonika after that? Hello? Yeah, great. Okay. Mute. Yeah, sorry. Thanks. Okay. okay, right. So I wanted to thank the panel for an interesting, uh, for interesting presentations, but also I think the discussion has been quite robust. I can see lots of uh, very good questions. Um, I have a very specific one about the records of the Lahore Museum itself. So I'm not talking about the archaeological, the objects. I'm not talking about the paintings. I'm not talking about the coins. I'm not talking about. Um, uh, any of the, uh, uh, the the items that tend to be put on display, but the records of the Lahore Museum itself um, would would where might they be? I mean, when I was in uh, Lahore a couple of years ago, I wanted to to find them and I just couldn't. Um, I didn't know whether they were in the state archives. I, I mean, there are different issues that, as an Indian, getting access to them would have would have been problematic, but I just would be interested in knowing where they actually are. Um, are they in Islamabad? Are they in, in the state archives? Are they somewhere else? Have we lost them? Thank you. I so, can respond to part of it. Yes, Nadeem Sahib, go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, in fact, you know, uh, I wanted to say this when we were talking about leaders. I think, uh, you know, I don't know if, I mean, I, I don't have a conclusive sort of, uh, you know, kind of uh, opinion on that. But I do think that, uh, that, uh, that in the British administration, weeding out record was a regular practice. These records... Uh, which were preserved as administrative records were of a different nature. Not every shred of paper which has been produced by the bureaucracy was meant to be kept. Now, this is also true for the Lahore Museum, where the administrative record of the Lahore Museum being considered sensitive. Once it was updated, the previous copy, copies were burned. Right, and while when we started uh, working at the archives uh, for the NCA, as you know, that uh, for a long time, from 1875 to probably 1940, you know, just before the partition, uh, uh, as Mew School of Art and War Museum were under one administrative authority, right. It was only in the 30s uh, that, uh, that an independent uh, curator was appointed. And by the time of partition, uh, Dr. Charles probably uh, was the director who was sadly thrown out by the post sort of partition administration, uh, which is a, very, is a very big loss. I mean, I just breaks my heart when I uh, see how shabbily that man was treated. Uh, in any case, and he eventually committed suicide in 68 while he was in India. Uh, uh, in any case, what I'm saying is, so, so in those times, as a personal uh, sort of uh, experience, uh, there, was a, uh, there was a senior employee of the Lahore Museum who came to us in 1999, uh, asking us that if we have any administrative records pertaining to Lahore Museum in our records, it being a, a shared sort of a mandate. So we did have a few files on the Mew School, which were like, uh, there was a file called Improvement of the Lahore Museum, uh, but they were not day-to-day -day administrative records. See? Now, 
he told me, I asked him this simple question that you are as old as us, but why don't you have record? He said that we had been officially uh, eliminating those records by burning them, right? So record burning uh, uh, is, a, is a administrative practice. It is not an aberration, right? And these records, as if we think that these uh, that the bureaucracy wanted us uh, to have access to the record, I don't, don't think so. They primarily these administrative records were only uh, kind of bound to the officials who were uh, you know kind of designated uh, you know to 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 review them or to view them. So this kind of unrestricted public access to the archives that has become uh, kind of a common sense wasn't a common sense before. Okay. So as the uh, in 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 uh, you know in brief, I would think that the uh, only record of Lahore Museum administration that you can find are the reports of the administration of the Lahore Museum, the annual reports, which were filed and probably they are uh, part of the records of the Department of Industries and public instruction, uh, you know, so it is, they are there. And uh, Shaila Bhatti, who has uh, done her PhD on Lahore Museum, has accessed those uh, records to actually reconstruct the story. Uh, and very little would be found in the Punjab archives and practically not a shred of paper elsewhere in Pakistan, National Archives or National Documentation Center or wherever. So the only place, uh, so, so the Lahore Museum sadly has very few administrative records beyond what is kept there. I am not privy to the internal administration of Lahore Museum. They must have filed. And another important thing about uh, the records of the Lahore Museum, that the records of the Lahore Museum was extremely sensitive because uh, I had sort of browsed through the old uh, catalog where the, the because of the uh, you know lack of photographic sort of uh, evidence, only uh, you know very uh, brief descriptions were written uh, to explain the the content of the collection. So it, if it says uh, uh, a silver bow, which is sort of, uh, you know, whatever color or form, right? And that's it. Now, as a result of that, a lot of this collection was misappropriated because they were not, uh, you know, cataloged in a foolproof manner. So uh, by default, that category of record become extremely sensitive because it could be, uh, you know, sort of uh, misused, and it could be, uh, you know what I'm saying? So that is why the records of the Lahore Museum never became a public knowledge or, a, or a administer, even an archive was created in the Lahore Museum because most of what they have done is uh, part of the internal administration and they don't see any reason for the public to know. And it is a historian's presumption that, that records of the colonial bureaucracy uh, was probably or could should be or could be accessed by the public. Even today, the bureaucracy thinks, at least for Pakistan, I don't know about India, the uh, Pakistani bureaucracy thinks that uh, records of its administration should not be a public knowledge. Uh, you know, uh, I know it as a fact that though uh, by the, by the con after the constitution of, you know, by the 73 constitution, which actually creates a legal structure for the archives in the country. All government departments are duty bound to sell their, send their non-current records to the National Archive. Not a, not a single department actually follows that. They would rather like to trash them or weed them or destroy them rather than sending them out to the, to the National Archive where they know that it can be read by the public. So that is level of secrecy is inbuilt into the structure of the colonial and the post-colonial administration. And, and this is one reason that the records are made so forbidding. You know, it is making difficult for you to access it because of this, this particular, you know, sort of <laughs> assumption of the bureaucracy. Thank you. Thank you, Nadeem Saab, for the you know detailed answer. I'm sure that answers uh, Malami's question. Now, we've Horribly overshot the time, but uh, we have 
three more people two more people who want to really come three more people who want to come in so i would request the people asking question to keep it brief and uh, let's have more briefer because we really do need to wind up by 6 6 pm so next we have mr rajmani he had a long career at the national archives of india and this is a rare chance for him to be able to talk to all of you so mr rajmani and then nonika datta she is a professor at jnu and then a gentleman uh, nitin goel he would like to ask question so very quickly let's go through this so mr aparna yeah aparna thank you for including me um, it's a very good that aparna and nonika both were a uh, frequent visitor of archives when i was posted there now i am retired person uh, your father and nonika's father was also a frequent visitor of archives uh, i must congratulate uh, all three uh, panelists of the pakistan uh, side they have given wonderful information and i fully support dadin saab's view what he has endorsed uh, i endorse his view uh, because uh, the way he narrated the story uh, the same story is here uh, about uh, uh, transfer of records and all that thing uh, since i have been associated with putting up many exhibitions uh, and uh, uh, i was involved in putting one exhibition on trial of bhagat singh in supreme court so after that i got a opportunity of uh, curating museum of uh, uh, bhagat singh in Chat his uh, hometown that is uh, you know in punjab uh, so if uh, ali usman kazmi sahab has uh, given so much information and uh, it was really exciting i just want to request him if he can share more information on bhagat singh because we are also equally mad on uh, about uh, bhagat singh activities uh, what records are there uh, whatever in national archives of india we have listed whatever in the state archives and you may be knowing that professor chaman lal is also working on this uh, one group and i am also in, a member of that group so my request is uh, for alishman uh, kazmi sahab if he can put more information somewhere in public domain in the form of uh, website or sir, that will be wonderful and as a professional we uh, i uh, i offer my services to my uh, other uh, side friend and uh, if they want any assistance i am very much here that's all thank you mr rajmani so we have we are creating a mili live document on mili's website where we are going to share all our details and if the panelists are comfortable uh, they can share uh, i can share your email ids on that sure. website people want to reach out to you so we'll talk come to that later Thank you, Mr. Rajmani. Uh, Nanika Datta, are you there? Can we unmute her for her to ask her question? And yeah. uh, it's on the Nonika, video as well. Just yeah. unmute. To see Hello. The Hello, I'm Nanika Datta. I really uh, greatly enjoyed the discussion today, but I shall be very brief. First is like you know, I'm myself working on uh, memories of Amritsar, the partition of 1947, and the Ranjit Singh period, and I can't access any. like really useful materials in my own country and i think most of the material is in pakistan and i was just wondering that how does one go about it that brings me to my second point i think people across the border on both sides of the border in india and uh, uh, in 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 west punjab and in east punjab are very keen to sort of extend hands in terms of thinking of an inclusive archive like can we think of a punjab archive across the border so um uh, so basically uh, you know this uh, this whole idea is 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 kind of difficult for me to think about but i think it's a very powerful idea of a digital space <coughs> where we can actually uh, you know um, uh, sort of put together the materials our own personal histories archival materials oral sources and other kind of official records to constitute a very inclusive open you know a sort of a really kind of free archive which would also heal the wounds of partition and and you know make this whole project a uh, sort of uh, very enriching and 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 harmonious in some ways so we move beyond the idea of archive as a kind of a site of governance to the idea of an archive of sharing and sharing knowledge and healing wounds and i think this is a plea that is coming from somebody who's actually not just struggling with sources in india or in punjab but also feels very strongly about you know amritsar being just one hour away from lahore what are we talking about and we've not done anything about this you know in in, in <laughs> can, we, can we do something so this is just a small uh, request thank you can i had some comment here sure kamal ji first of all nanika um, 
I, I am not into very much into this Amrita venture that you are in. But when it comes to Maharaja Ranjit Singh, um, uh, please feel free to contact me. Maybe I'll be able to help you in that regard. Because my research, my PhD dissertation is all about Maharaja Ranjit Singh and his era. So I can help you in that. Maybe, maybe I can help you in that. And then coming to the other part of your uh, very emotional and very heart-touching conversation, it's a wonderful dream. But um, the reality can only be materialized by people uh, I don't know if they are into this kind of uh, venture at all because the thing is that you have to go through lots of uh, bureaucratic struggle political scenarios apart from so many other things so it's not just uh, us if it was depending on us then things would have been completely different but there are so many other stakeholders involved in this scenario and um, unfortunately, these are the stakeholders who are the decision makers as well. But uh, uh, saying this, um, on uh, as much as we can um, help each other, we'll definitely do that. But when it comes to the official uh, coordination and when it comes to uh, some kind of an official relationship, for that you need to go through lots of red tape and lots of other, uh, uh, I must say, formalities. So let's hope and pray for the best if we come up to that point where we can share the information and we can heal our wounds uh, in some future date. But please do not think of me as a pessimistic person. But this is how I, I look at things. Uh, they are very difficult and they are very different. On both Badada and also of Asia, if you look at it from this perspective. Hmm. Thank you, Kamaji. May I respond to this? Go, go ahead, Nadim, sir. Ji, uh, uh, I think, uh, as uh, Dr. Kaval has rightly pointed out, that uh, this people-to-people -people contact, be it academic-to-academic -academic contact, is mediated through these in, you know, interstate relations, which are at its uh, low point in our history. Right? There were high uh, points as well, which uh, you know, gave me the opportunity to travel all across India with students, uh, it was an extraordinary experience. But in any case, I'm saying, I, I was thinking that this particular uh, proposal for a, a digital archive of partition or digital archive of South Asia uh, with, with the objective that you spelled out, I think this could be, uh, you know, gainfully uh, put up to UNESCO. And, uh, and, 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 and I think, and I'm not saying UNESCO, India or Pakistan, I'm saying work through them to the, uh, to the UNESCO headquartered in Paris. Uh, some years ago, uh, through a, just a sort of a good chance, I um, was kind of happened to meet the Secretary General UNESCO, uh, Aruna Bekova, if I remember correctly, so she's, uh, so, so I, during that sort of interaction, I gave her this idea of uh, creating this uh, digital sort of uh, space for Indian Pakistan museum collections and citing uh, Chandhain as an example. And she immediately kind of, uh, you know, latched on to the idea and uh, kind of reassured me and instructed her staff to actually follow it up with me. Uh, for some odd reason, got dropped out. But, uh, you know, so based on that response, I, I do think that if uh, we kind of somehow work it out uh, to, with, the, with the UNESCO, uh, it, it can be translated into interview. Uh, this isn't something which I would discount because UNESCO has a global mandate and it's an idea which, do, which is beyond politics. So we are not engaged, being part of the, you know, interstate rivalry in any case. Thank you, Nadeem Saab. Now, very quickly, Nitin Goyal, we have exactly one minute left. So could you please come in quickly and ask a question? Yeah, yeah. thank you, Apna. And thank you to Mili Network also. Uh, so such an enriching this archives week celebrating on this. Uh, my question is to Dr. Kamal and Usman. Uh, I worked in National Archives of India and State Archives also, and I found it that uh, during reading the State Archives, many records, we found there are lots of information about the Multans and the Baulpur area. Uh, 
but the other side of that area is like the information we do not get it about is there any such sources which available there or digitized there so which we can share uh, with the indian counterpart scholars also there or is can you share the scholars list who are working on these bordering princely states or on uh, the working on this uh, area where that both india and pakistan are collaborating with each other so, uh, just this is a simple one and want to know the digitization status of uh, pakistan archives also so that we we get to know about what are the records which can be accessible and shared that's it i can answer you very quickly here that uh, um, it comes to multan and bahawalpur of course punjab archives has some of the record like there uh, lying there and there are uh, not some individual but uh, Uh, the administrative uh, government of Multan, they are working on it. They are developing some kind of an archive, and so is the case with the Bahawalpur. I am not sure about the Sind. Uh, and the other thing is that, uh, as long as the digitization project is concerned, uh, uh, unfortunately, right now, since 19th March, it is on a standstill, and uh, due to this COVID-19 uh, issue that we are all facing everywhere in the world. and we are not even sure that when we will be able to get it re uh, started uh, in the near future things like that but uh, it is still going on it is still in process but uh, we do we are facing some huge budget constraints right now so let's hope and pray for the best uh, but uh, many of the documents as i said before more than 100000 has been uh, you know it's been uh, which uh, scanned and all that but they are not available online because for that we need to adopt a proper methodology and once that uh, methodology is uh, implemented only then the people uh, i hope from all over the world will have access to these documents but this uh, project is still in process okay thank you kamal ji i'm afraid we have to stop now and thank you for a lovely panel that was a great deal of information shared on both sides and hopefully we'll do this again so thank you all for joining us and hope this conversation continues and i'll we'll be sharing the link for the mili website with all of you where we can you know uh, where all the programs will be recorded and put up all the recordings will be put up and uh, so thank you again kamal ji nadeem saab ali uh, hope to collaborate with you all and uh, uh, venkat has shared the link for the mili network Uh, on the chat so please you can copy it from there and save it so thank you all shall we say goodbye